in the study of God's word there, James chapter 1. And we've been looking at the question the last three weeks from James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Wisdom or the wind? What is driving you? Wisdom or the wind? We'll start our reading right in James chapter 1 and verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let's pray. <clears throat> Fathers, we come to you. We pray that you'd help us to understand your word and help us to apply it to our lives. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will put his finger on different areas of our lives that need encouragement or challenge or comfort, and that we will be directed into the wisdom of God. I know that God's people have come today expecting to hear from your word and expecting to hear from you, and so I pray that that's what they will hear. They will hear the word of God and not man's opinion, but that which challenges us and that which changes us by the Spirit of God in conjunction with the word of God. We thank you again for this, these passages and how you dealt with the people then and how you've preserved your word for us to this day so that we may be also challenged and edified and built up spiritually by the words that you've provided to us. We pray that you'd help us now, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 1, verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. We began there in this question, wisdom or the wind, and we're reminded that uh, many people lack wisdom. And in fact, all of us at one point or another in our lives lack wisdom, and these people were in danger of lacking wisdom in their lives. And they were lacking the wisdom of even assembly. They were getting away from God's place of wisdom as we dealt with where wisdom comes from, what is the source of wisdom? Because he says, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So it's the wisdom of God that we're after. And where do we find the wisdom of God? We find the wisdom of God and the truth of God from three sources that are in conjunction one with another. One is the spirit of God, one is the word of God, and one is the church of God. We have the spirit of truth, we have the word of truth, and we have the pillar and ground of the truth. And if we're going to have a certainty and stability in our lives spiritually, then we need to be firmly planted in all three of those things. Firmly planted in the Word of God, looking into the Word of God, uh, 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 steadfastly listening to the Spirit of God in our lives as He uses the Word of God in our hearts, and steadfastly committed to the Church of God and accountable to it. And these things are necessary for us to have spiritual wisdom. And if we get away from any one of these things, then we don't have spiritual wisdom. And that's where we need to remind ourselves of when I come to a point of realizing I'm in lack. And that's the most important thing for us to realize is realize that we will lack wisdom in this life, but we need God's wisdom. And we're not talking about just wisdom to make a decision about whether we're going to, as we've said, buy a Ford or Chevy. We all know which one you should buy. Uh, I've, I've owned both, so it doesn't matter to me. I'd buy whichever one's cheapest and best at the time. I, uh, and they both work great. These are just physical things. And do, can we ask God for his wisdom regarding those things? Absolutely. And will he give us his wisdom regarding those things? Surely. But this is dealing with spiritual issues in our lives. This is God imparting to us his spiritual wisdom so that the trajectory of our entire life and the decisions that we make spiritual and otherwise are all governed by his will, governed by his wisdom, governed by his purpose in our lives. Are we doing that? And is that our focus? If not, then we're going to have trouble in our life. If, if it is, then God promises he will give that wisdom. And so when we're lacking wisdom, we can go from that point of lacking where we weren't uh, uh, having God's wisdom to the point of having God's wisdom so that we can be confident in our spiritual lives. We can look forward to the next step in our lives knowing that God is with us and knowing that we're under his care. We hear, I've heard many people say that statement, the safest, safest place to be is in the center of God's will. But let's make sure that we're there and that we're not causing undue stress in our lives and undue persecution and undue trouble in our lives because we're not really in God's will. We're not really following his will and then trying to claim his will when we see these other things happening. And some people will go through trials and they'll say, well, it's just the will of God in my life. Well, 
it might be the will of God in your life because you weren't following his wisdom. You were following your own wisdom. And we have to be very careful that we're following God's wisdom. Then when the trouble comes, we have a confidence. Then when the trouble comes, we can rightly and truly say, I am in God's wisdom. I'm following God's wisdom. So the trouble that comes is from the Lord, and he's using it in my life, and I'm dependent on him, and I'm safe in his will. He says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. And as we dealt with last week, that phrase, in faith, is not just talking about believing that God will answer you, but it's in the dative case, that, that prepositional phrase, asking in faith, giving us the idea of a location. And we should recognize that we have to operate from a position of faithfulness in the Lord if we're going to be receiving his faith or, or his wisdom. And, of course, we need to believe that God will uh, fulfill his promises, but what he's detailing here, I believe, is that we need to be faithful. That's what he deals with in James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. It's not being faithful. So where is there really faith where there is no faithfulness? And that's now called into question. And God says, if you want my wisdom, then you're going to have to operate in faith. That is, in faithfulness. And many people will claim wisdom. They'll claim the Spirit of God. They'll claim they prayed about something. But they're operating not in faith. That is, not in faithfulness to God's word. And so those things fall down to the ground. Their words fall. Because it's not true. It's not real. It's assumed or it's perceived or it is hoped that I'm doing the right thing or it is just stated that I'm doing the right thing without recognizing God's will in the situation. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. We looked at that word wavering last week, and that's the first description uh, of, uh, of the double-minded man. He's, waver. He's a waverer between two opinions. He halts between two opinions, as Joshua dealt with the children of Israel. And he's like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. A wave of the sea. And God says this, For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. In other words, if we're not going to come to him and recognize that we need his wisdom, we're not asking him for wisdom, we're not realizing that we're lacking wisdom, then we're not going to receive it. But let him ask. But he says, also, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Those who don't come to the Lord in faith and in faithfulness are not going to receive God's wisdom. There's a principle in Scripture that goes like this. Light obeyed increases light given. Have you ever heard that before? Light obeyed increases light given. And it is that way in our spiritual lives. When we obey the light that God has given us and we operate in faithfulness, then God will give us light for the next step. And we can be confident that we're taking the next step in God's will. But when we refuse to obey God's will in the light that he has given us, we take the next step into darkness. And we might get where we want to go. But we're doing it blindly. We're doing it without the Lord. So stay in the light of God's direction, in the light of God's word, in the place of his wisdom. This is where we can find it. He says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And we remember that illustration of that child who comes to his father and his father says, don't do such and such. I've told you 10 times, don't do such and such. And if you get hurt doing that, what do we say? Don't come crying to me. Don't come crying to daddy. This is what the Lord is saying in a much stronger manner. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. We're not going to receive God's blessing. We're not going to receive God's wisdom. We're not going to receive God's light for the next step of the way. This is what we must do. And then he gives the sad conclusion of this in verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And that's where we are this morning. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And this is the anguish of questioning. I'm not going to refer to that title much, but as the outline goes, the outline that I have, this is the anguish of questioning. So we're supposed to ask the question of, for, of wisdom for the Lord, and we look to the answer, look to the authority of wisdom, all of those things, but now we have the anguish of questioning. That is, do I really have to obey God's way? Or can I do it my way and be okay? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, the Lord says. Uh, as many of you know, as we announced last Wednesday, my wife and I are expecting, which I'm, uh, we're ex very excited about. We're having a boy. Uh, if the uh, prediction thing is right, you know, maybe it could be wrong, I guess, but uh, we're supposed to have a boy. And we're excited about that, and now we're starting to think about names. And uh, uh, you who had children, you had to agonize over a name, had to think about a name. And maybe you got the list from online, or you got the baby books, the name, baby name books, and maybe, the, maybe it was just easy for you, and you just chose the name on a whim, but it's not always been that easy for us. 
And uh, sometimes the husband will like one name and the wife will like another name. And they may, maybe finally they come to agreement and then the next week they're backing away from that. The woman does that, by the way, not the man, okay? <laughs> Uh, but for my wife and I, especially the boys, we like to give them a, a, a Bible name, a name that has a, a special meaning. So between the, uh, when it came time for us to have our first child, uh, Eli, Elisha, the fir fir first one we named it was really a, a, an agonizing thing and we were very uh, worried about it. And so we really spent a lot of focus and a lot of time and a lot of energy on that name, as I'm sure you did. And finally, we settled on the name Elisha. Uh, I had been studying through the prophet, uh, life of the prophet Elisha and I was really challenged by his uh, his, uh, his uh, fervor for the Lord, and I was thankful to hear his prayer, Lord, give me a double spirit of, uh, Elisha, uh, of Elijah. And I thought, man, that'd be, that'd be great. If my son excelled past me spiritually and was, did great things for the Lord, that'd be a wonderful thing. Uh, Elisha is a name, I like to say it's a name you can't run from. Uh, because somebody asks your name, my name's Elisha. Well, where did you get that name? Why do you have that name? It's not a normal name. Now, you can name your child whatever you want. You can name him, uh, you know, uh, 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 whatever, uh, I was going to say Joe, but we have some Joe's, Joseph's here, so Joe, Joe's a great name. Joseph's a great name. Uh, yeah, it's a generic name. That's so, yeah. Uh, we, we, you can name your kid any, anything you want. Uh, so there's nothing spiritual there, but this is what we like to do. We like to name him. We found that name, Elisha. We chose that name, and so the time came to be born, and he was immediately named Elisha Andrew Stockton, which is a great name. We filled out the birth certificate, and we informed the church family and our own family of the name of our new child, and uh, it was the next day after he was born, maybe the second day after, his bo after he was born, Amanda had to stay in the hospital for a little bit with him. And I left the hospital to go retrieve a few things from the house. Uh, and I was not to be gone long, and nor was I gone long. But on my way back, I received a phone call from my wife as she was there in the hospital room. And she called me in an absolute panic. And uh, she, was, she was crying, and she was upset, and she was, could not get the words out of her mouth, and I was really worried about what was going on. And finally, I realized that uh, she was telling me we had to change our son's name. I was thinking, why, why would we need to change our son's name? He was just born. This is the name that we, that we, that we chose. And she said, uh, and, and this is how I understand it, that apparently one of the nurses came in and said something to the effect of, uh, you know, uh, spoke about Elisha and asked how she was doing. And to a new mother still uh, in, uh, recovering from childbirth, she was very distraught over these things. And she was extremely bothered, and she perceived that for the rest of his life, sorry, Eli, that people would think that he was a girl, <laughs> uh, as you're a little baby there. Uh, and of course, I'm a very good husband. I said something to my wife to the effect of, calm down, you know, <laughs> which probably didn't help very much. But I told her we would not be changing his name. We don't need to change his name. It's going to be okay. And I assured her everything will be just fine. It's all going to be fine. This was a fluke thing. This is never going to happen again. Just let it go and relax. I thought, Nobody's going to think that he's a girl. Elisha is obviously a boy's name. All of these things I told her at the time. <clears throat> so we had several instances of back and forth over the next couple days and over the next uh, couple weeks. And Amanda would question these things, and I'd say, Amanda, it's going to be all right. We've chosen this name, and we're not going to change his name. We, we have assigned his name. I also told her over and over again that nobody would think what she was thinking, and that, that was just the one time. It's Passover. So a few, a few weeks later, we went into the doctor's office for our son for a visit, and we're waiting in the waiting room. And what happens? But the nurse comes out to the door. You know how they do, and they call for whoever's next. And he, uh, he, she said, uh, Alicia, as she looked at her chart. And then you get back in the room and they used a, the feminine gender to refer to our son. And Amanda is like, I told you so, you know. Uh, this happened not once and not twice, but three or four or five. I think it might have happened five different times uh, uh, very early on in his life. I could not believe it. I was, I was a, a distraught over that it happened, not that I was going to change his name. Uh, but we had this, uh, this, uh, this going on. It was a, a, a trouble. Dad, until so it's injury, I will just say, that over the, all of these things did settle down and we were all uh, didn't have any recurring trouble with this over the few years. And, and uh, it was a fluke for the first couple times there when the Lord called me here as the pastor of Bible Baptist Church, we came here and we found that our dear friends, the Sherry's, had named their daughter Elisha. Uh, so it, it can be a girl's name, apparently. So obviously this illustration is not about right and wrong. You can name your child whatever you want to. And we could have changed his name if we wanted to, as Amanda wanted to, and that would have been not a moral issue, okay? 
But I said, no, we're not going to change his name. We brought the, his name, and we, we named his name, and that's what it is. Now, I want you to get the spiritual point here, okay? What happened there was a pressure. Doubt was brought into the equation. Question was brought into the equation, and if it was a moral issue, what did we need to do? If it was a doctrinal issue or a righteous issue or a, a wisdom issue, what did we need to do? Stay the course, which we did, amen. And no one questions his gender. Uh, we stayed the course. Spiritually, this is what happens in our lives. On a much bigger level, the pressure comes into our lives. The parades, moss, the trials of life come in. All kinds of different circumstances, all kinds of different pressures in our lives. And they challenge us to make changes away from the moorings of those three things we talked about, the word of truth and the place of truth and the spirit of truth together. We, Satan wants to get our moorings off those things. He wants us to get away from those things. And we have to stay in the word. We have to stay according to God's wisdom for our lives. What occurs in all of our lives is that we have some pressure. And so many times we children of the Lord, when we're confronted with the pressure, we choose to become completely unsettled in our Christian walk and we follow the path of least resistance. I don't want to listen to that, so I'm going to go over here. I'm going to feign dis dis disagreement and disapproval of that, and I'm going to go over here. Uh, or I'm upset with how so-and-so is treating me. Even my spouse is treating me. And so now I'm going to operate this way because they've done that. Now I'm going to do this. And we see how that pressure has gotten us off our moorings. No longer are we operating under the control of the Spirit of God, but we're operating according to reacting, reacting in our life doing what we want to, operating according to the desires of our flesh. We choose what seems to be the path of least resistance, and we forsake that which we scripturally, if we would get our mind in scriptures, what we scripturally know to be true. We sacrifice the will and wisdom of God at the altar of the wind of our flesh. Remember that question, wisdom or the wind? And I know that we do this with just a little bit of pressure. All it takes is someone to look at us sideways or to tell us something we don't really like to hear. And that's all, that's all it takes for us to get off of mornings. These people were enduring real persecution, where they were told you cannot meet together as God's people. We're going to persecute you. And they've been driven out of their homes and out of their place of origin, Jerusalem, into these surrounding regions because of they were doing that. And now they face the real question, I will not come to church because, uh, uh, because we didn't like something the preacher said. Will not come to church because somebody looked at me sideways. Somebody judged me. You ever been judged? You've probably been judged. Somebody's probably judged you. You probably judged somebody else too. Somebody said, I don't want to go to church because there's a lot of hypocrites there. Yes, there is. That's why we're here. They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. We're trying to grow. So let's do that. But it doesn't take very much to get off of us off of our moorings, does it? It doesn't take, a, take very much to move us and to shift us and to weigh anchor and now we're drifting in the wind. The wind and the waves were wavering and were wandering and were unstable. The people to whom James was writing were under this severe pressure. And yet, James gave them the direct and forceful challenge straight from the Holy Spirit of God. Do not follow the wind of your own flesh or the wind of circumstances that are brought into your life or the wind of temptation or the wind of perception of what is going on. Follow the wisdom of God. Follow the wisdom of God. One thing that we need to be careful of doing is coming to this passage and reading this passage as just being a person of, who can't make up their mind. The double-minded man just can't make up their mind. And that's a surface understanding of the word. But it's not just someone who can't make up their mind about doing one thing or another, whether we're going to go to Burger King or McDonald's. Uh, th this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual decisions, consequential decisions, uh, steps in our lives that are spiritual issues, reactions to people. These things that are eter of eternal consequence. The double-minded man is not necessarily the theme of the book of James, but he's the reason for the book of James. In other words, if we weren't double-minded people and had the tendency to be double-minded, then we wouldn't have the book of James. The book of James exists because God's people tend to be double-minded. This has been true for the entire history of Christianity and the history of the people of God, even in the Old Testament. In other words, if we Christians didn't have the testament, tendency to be double-minded, then the book of James probably would not need to have been written. But the Lord gave already a few descriptions of the double-minded man. First, there are those who are, quote, lacking, as he says in verse 5. They're lacking. And then he says in verse 6, they're wavering. 
And now in verse 8, he says they're double-minded. Double-minded. There have been those who have been hesitant to honor the Lord. They've been hesitant to obey the Lord. We can't be of those because we're lacking in faith. The double-minded man is lacking. He's also wavering. Remember, he's overanalyzing. He's hesitating. He's considering all the pros and cons of something. Dia crino, crino judge, dia through. He's judging through it, and he's, he's factoring in what will happen to me if I obey. Or she's saying, I don't really like that. What will, what will the result be if I do that? Where's my protection from that if I obey God? This is the double-minded man, and he's lacking, and he's wavering. Now he's thinking, do I really need to obey the Lord, or is there a better way? Is there a way out? Is there some way I can twist out of this? The second introduction here to this double-minded man is that waverer. He's the wind tester. Wants to see which way the wind's blowing before he goes and obeys the Lord. The waverer says, I'm not sure if I'll obey, obey, because I'm not sure if I can trust. I'm not sure if I'll get the results that I want. I'm not sure if I'll get the pleasurable thing in life that I'm desiring. The waverer is following the wind, the wind of their own heart and the wind of their own mind, the wind of their own flesh, their own wisdom. I feel this, I think this, I need this. Instead of being completely committed to the wisdom of God, they hold half trust in his way and half trust in themselves. And half trust is no trust, it's mistrust. They try to provide for themselves or protect themselves, give themselves the sustenance or pleasure that they think that God might withhold from them. And now they are the double-minded man. As he says in verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When you begin to double judge in your mind, you're demonstrating that underneath all of the good and righteous things on the outside, and many people have all of these things together, they dress right, they come to church, and yet inside there's this double-mindedness going on because they're double-judging everything. And they're analyzing everything to make sure that it's according to their standards and not just that it's according to God's standards. If we do these things, we're demonstrating that we might have these things right on the outside, but in the heart, on the inside, deep down, we're double-minded. That is, you are daisukos. That's the word daisukos, or two-souled, divided soul, die, giving us this idea of the opposing thought, internal division of something, and sukos, speaking of our spiritual heart. So the person who is lacking, from verse 5, who is not being devoted to the wisdom of God, is also wavering, according to verse 6, and that he's questioning whether or not he ought to obey God. He's weighing his options. But ultimately, these things are just a, d- a description of what is going on in the inside, and that is he is daisukos. He has a divided heart. A divided heart. Every believer, young or aged, new or matured, has the tendency to be pushed away from the moorings of God's wisdom and is at risk of having a divided heart. James used this phrase again in James chapter 4, verse 8, to those too proud to admit that they need the cleansing of God in various matters. In submission to God, regarding gossip, interpersonal strife, the love of this world, all of these things and more from the book of James. But in chapter 4, verse 8, he said, Draw an eye to God, and he will draw an eye to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. See, double-mindedness and divided-heartedness is a sin that needs repenting of. It's that which we need to cleanse our hand of and our hearts need to be purified from. Notice he says, purify your hearts, because they have a divided heart. All of those sins and more spring from the heart of a believer who is focused on his way and not on God's. He professes the name of Christ. He may resist the cardinal sins. I don't do this and that. He seems put together. He may generally or mostly agree and and may even offer an amen once in a while, but under the surface is a divided heart. Eventually that comes out. It might stay hidden for a week or a month or a year or even 10 years, but eventually when that's fostered and that's allowed to control, it starts to come out. And it starts to come out in the sins that are listed in the book of James. We see then that the double mind leads to being spiritually unstable. As he says in verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Unstable. We speak about some aged politicians, one in particular, and we say that person is unstable. Or we speak of a certain one who's running for uh, president. Uh, She's not really doing much to run for president, but she's up in the polls apparently. And we'd say, oh, she's unstable sometimes. Unstable. We, we look at somebody who's a little off and we say they're unstable. That's a good description of the word unstable, even as we look at it spiritually. A little unstable. No longer is the direction determined solely by the wisdom of God, but it is filtered through the wind of one's own perspective and pleasure. 
I look at the will of God and then I test it to see if it's exactly what I want it to be. I'll inspect it to see if it will work out okay according to my stipulations and my standards. But instead of just following the wisdom of God, I question it and now I'm unstable. These say, this is what I perceive to be right and will often even attempt to add some facet of the wisdom of God to it to make it sound spiritual. Uh, you know, we'll bring, bring in a, a scripture from over here or something from over here and say, this is why. And, 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 and try to make it sound spiritual. Or try to give a good reason for why, a good excuse for why it's okay for me to do this. I'm, I, I, would, I, say, I understand that would normally be wrong, but it's okay for me because such and such circumstance or such and such situation. All this is is a paper mache covering. And if you put pressure on it, you'd find that it's just chicken wire underneath and it would be crushed. It looks like a rock, but it's really paper mache. And it doesn't hold up under the scrutiny of God's word. And the result of it is being unstable. Unstable. The Greek word is a triple compound word. It's three different words that have been smushed together and bring us this English idea of unstable. And it's three words, meaning down or against the first phrase, the ah. And then the second part is stasis, which is the Greek word for stand. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the first word is ah, that means not. It's, a, it's an anti. No, it's a negative particle. And the second word is kata, which is down or against. So not, against, stand. Three words put together. Not, against, and stand. The idea is not able to stand against anything. Not able to stand. When the wind comes, not able to stand against the wind. The wind of a circumstance, the wind of somebody side-eyeing you, the wind of something that I don't exactly like, the wind of some financial pressure, or the wind of a physical issue that comes into my life, wind of a family issue comes, I choose to respond to the wind and let the wind direct me instead of let the Lord direct me. Why? Because I'm unstable. I can't stand against that wind. I can't stand against that wind because I don't have a right, I have a divided heart. So the strength is not there. The heart is not unified to serve the Lord, not able to stand against. This person is spiritually unstable. They're not able to stand against the wind of persecution or circumstances or hurts or weaknesses or the temptation of the flesh or even the challenge to growth that God brings into our lives. We can't even stand against that pressure. And we allow the wind to lead us and to guide us and to direct us. An almost identical word is used again by James in chapter 3, verse 8, regarding the tongue of the double-minded. He says in verse 8, The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. The word unruly is a word almost, almost identical to the word for uh, unstable means not able to be controlled. Not able to stand against and not able to be controlled. It is a tongue out of control of the Holy Spirit of God, out of control of the spirit of wisdom, out of control of the spirit of truth. So when you're a double-minded Christian, you're unstable, you're both unable to stand, and you're out of control spiritually. Out of control spiritually. Many, many Christians are out of control spiritually. They respond only to what their flesh tells them. They're out of control. They're not controlled by the Spirit of God, and therefore they're unstable. Therefore, they are unruly. Because instead of being directed and governed by the Spirit of God and by the wisdom of God, they're doing what makes them happy. They're doing what seems right in their own eyes. We have to get back to saying, no, I, Lord, I will obey your wisdom no matter what. And no matter if it doesn't seem right to me and I can't see all the answers, I'm going to obey it. As you're raising your children, there are some things you explain to your children right up front, and there are other things that you say, you'll understand that a better when you're a little bit older. And that comes in stages. Do you know that comes in stages, spiritual growth for God's people as well? And we might be adults, but there are some things that God shrouds from our view. All we know is the step to obey. I obey that step, and then God brings his answers. Lord, why are you putting me through this trial? Why are you allowing this trial in my life? I don't know. I'm going to obey you here. And that answer comes down the road a little bit later. Uh, why is this, why, I, I don't understand, Lord, this thing that uh, I know is from your word that you want me to do, it's the direction of your church, it's all of these things, I know that this is right, and this is good, and this is not against scripture, but I don't see the practical outworking of it here being good over here. What should I do? Oh, I'm going to stay the course and obey the Lord, you know, a little bit down the road, I'll understand that. A little bit down the road, I'll see this was in the Lord's will, this was his direction, but I stayed with him in it. 
I want to challenge you, don't listen to the wind. Don't listen to the wind of worry and want. As he says back in James chapter 1 and one verse later in James chapter 1 verse 9, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. See, if God gives you a blessing in your life and you've been a brother of low degree, low position, low income, low intellect, <laughs> whatever it is, and God gives you uh, some advancement, he praise God for it. And if you've been placed of advancement and you get diminished, praise God for it. We can honor the Lord in every situation. Don't let the wind of want change you from being controlled by the Spirit of God. Don't listen to the wind of wealth, as he says in verse 10. The rich, in that he's made low. 1 Timothy chapter 6, he said, Warn them that are rich in this world to the pastor there. Psalm 73, uh, he, he was uh, upset, the psalmist was, when he looked at the prosperity of the wicked. And he came to a point where he realized he was pricked in his own heart when he saw them come to nothing overnight. And he realized, wait a second, the Lord's dealing with these things. Don't listen to the wind of wealth. Men, don't listen to the wind of, of women. Don't listen to the wind of women. The women of the culture telling you what you ought to be. No, do what God wants you to be. Ecclesiastes says, don't, don't look for the approval of women, the relationship with women that is outside of what the scripture dictates for it, that it ought to be. That's what Ecclesiastes is about. Uh, one, of the, one of the major themes of Ecclesiastes. Uh, even work. Don't listen to the wind of work. Work is calling for my time and demanding all of my energy and my focus. No, keep that in a priority. Keep it in its proper place. Don't listen to the wind of people who whine. Don't listen to the wind of whining. Back in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 27, uh, Moses recounted how the people murmured. He said, ye murmured in your tents. I thought that's a great uh, men's camp out verse, Pastor David. Ye murmured in your tents. Don't listen to the wind of whining. Don't listen to the wind of wandering. We live for our own lust. Second Corinthians, I'll turn you there if you would. Chapter 1. And verse 12, Paul said this, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with, note it, fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, or our lifestyle in the world, and more abundantly to you word. In other words, we didn't listen to the wandering desires of our flesh. We lived in sincerity and commitment to you or to the Lord, and therefore we're faithful servants to you. Don't listen to the wind of wishy-washiness, false doctrine and compromise that wants to come into the world. James chapter 1, verse 27, he says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and note this, to keep himself unspotted from the world. You want to become as much like the world, dress as much like the world, be as casual as the world regarding purity, uh, as you possibly can, then you're not, you don't have pure religion. You have what would be defiled religion and maybe false religion. Or what about those, as Second Peter tells us, who being unlearned and unstable, there's that same word again, rest the scriptures. He's not talking about people who haven't studied the scriptures in Second Peter chapter 3 or, don't, uh, or haven't put in work uh, theologically. He's not talking about them. He's talking about those who have not honored the Lord's wisdom in their life. Therefore, they're ignorant. They're ignorant because they haven't honored God's wisdom, not because they didn't uh, go to a class or get, a, get some extra insight, but because they've not followed God's wisdom. Therefore, they're ignorant of God's ways, and they're unstable, which is the word that James uses right here about the double-minded man. That's what makes them unstable, not because they didn't have a, a, an extra degree, but their instability and their ignorance comes from not being uh, devoted to the wisdom of God. Don't follow the wisdom of wonder, what I mean is the wisdom of the what if. Fear. Be afraid about everything that could happen. Do you remember COVID? Do you remember how fearful people were and how it ch totally changed the way they behaved in every facet of life? Financially, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Changed people's behavior. Why? They listened to the wind the wind of the what if. What about the wind of whispering? When someone brings some gossip or someone brings a complaint and they whisper it in your ear. James, James again deals with that in James chapter 3. Look at verse 13. 
He says, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Notice it, meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above. It's wisdom, but it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envying and strife is, there's confusion and every, every, every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above, that's the wisdom that we need from the Lord. That's James 1 wisdom. Found in James 3, 17, the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Proverbs chapter 16, and I'll read it. You don't have to turn there. Verse 28, the Lord says, A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. People who would otherwise have unity in Christ's body are separated and at, at odds in each, between each other because of a whisperer. Don't follow the wind of self-will or pride. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the, or verse 7, Fear, Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Don't be wise in thine own eyes. You see, the double-minded man, by the way, is unstable in all his ways. He's unstable in all his ways. The word all here is emphatic. It's in an emphatic position in the word, in the verse. He's unstable in all his ways. We are meant to notice the word all. And the Lord is telling us that the result of having a divided heart is very far-reaching. It may begin in one area of our lives, but it affects and infects all of our ways going forward. It affects everything going forward. You say, well, I'm still going to church or I'm still doing this righteous thing. Yes, but it's now tainted. Even the good things that you do when you refuse to operate in the wisdom of God become tainted. And now you may be trying to practice your spiritual gift or maybe you may be trying to advance over here or maybe you're trying to raise your children in righteousness here. But you know what? That's all tainted now. You're going to have struggles there, and you're not going to fulfill the potential that God has for you. It affects and infects all of our ways going forward. Note this and mark it down in the lives of those who get away from God's wisdom and double-mindedness. They're dissatisfied often. They don't really like where they end up. They strove so hard to get to a certain place, and then they find they don't really like it at all and didn't really change anything for them. They often become disheartened because they bring more heartache into their lives than needed to be there. They're disillusioned. They react in disdain for God's sources of wisdom that they have departed from. They're spiritually dilapidated and become involved in many different damaging and death-producing sins in their lives. Why? Because they're unstable, because they have a divided heart. They've ignored the spirit of wisdom and truth, the word of wisdom and truth, and the place of wisdom and truth. And it affects their families, it affects their finances, it affects their faithfulness, and it affects their future. Not all right away, but it taints those things going forward. So what does unstable in all his ways look like? Well, it looks like maybe a bad decision in who you marry because you weren't following God's wisdom and it reaps, reaps negative consequences down the road. You didn't follow God's wisdom and so you made the wrong job decision with results that hamper spiritually or financially or the family. You make decisions regarding waste and mismanagement of finances because you didn't bring those things to the submission of the wisdom of God so that circumstances are constantly on edge or uncertain or your level of diligence was not committed to the wisdom of God, and so you can't bring in the income because you've not been diligent. It results often in a, de a departure from the church of Christ outside the will of God. And sometimes people leave inside the will of God, and the Lord blesses that as they go forward. Sometimes people leave outside of the will of God. Most often people leave outside of the will of God, and that damages them. So, well, they went to another church. What they do for the Lord is tainted because they're not followed the wisdom of God, and they're going to suffer the consequences of that. These things lead to a spiraling over time, over time, over decades even, of disobedience to Scripture, first here, then there, and so on, and so on. And you see it in the results of their children as they come up, and it's a sad thing. We continue in bad decisions, and uncertainty is the order of the day. Uh, here, uh, over here, often these people, anxiety and depression rules their life instead of the peace of God. They're unstable. Anger and resentment and bitterness take over their life. They're hothead because they're unstable. Their tongue gets out of control. They're unstable. 
Sound doctrine becomes ignored. They're unstable. They have a rocky marriage that can never find peace. because They're unstable. They're not following God's wisdom. Well, I'm doing this spiritual thing. Yeah, but you're not following God's wisdom, so you're, gonna, you're, you're, gonna be, you're not going to reach the potential. You're going to reach a ceiling that's low, and you're not going to be able to get past that. But you didn't follow God's light on step one. So you're certainly not going to have it for step 10. It's going to be tainted. There are times when the first decision to be wise in my own eyes does not seem to be immediately destructive. I feel like it might work out okay. Someone may become financially bettered, or a woman may feel more free and unhindered by her choices. Sometimes the wicked do prosper, but this is only for a season. Psalm 106. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to be a little bit late this morning. Uh, Pastor David is here, so I thought he needed a good shot. That's why we're going long. Psalm 106, verse 12. Then they believed, then believed they his words, they sang his praise. They soon forgot his works, they waited not for his counsel. Notice whose counsel they followed, not God's counsel, not God's wisdom. But they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness. They followed their lust instead of God's wisdom. And tempted God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. They got what they wanted, physically, but spiritually, leanness to their soul. Better for us to say with Psalm 119, verse 24, Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. I followed your will. Genesis chapter 12. Uh, as I was talking to Pastor David actually yesterday about this message today, he mentioned this passage. I said, I'm putting it in. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And the Lord did guide Abram. And he came down to the place of Bethel. Verse 8. He removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called the name of the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. You see what he did there? He sought God's wisdom. He called upon the name of the Lord. He had an altar there and he was focused on the Lord. But what happened? Abraham journeyed going on still toward the south. And what happened? There was a famine in the land. And so... He was in the promised land before, land that God had promised to him, but now he sees there's a famine. So now he's going to make a practical decision, quote unquote. What would normally be wise in mine own eyes? I've got to get to a place where there's food. Instead of, as he did, call upon the name of the Lord, he went to Egypt. What happened in Egypt? He got in all kinds of trouble in Egypt. The Lord did not bless his way. He did not follow God's wisdom. So he was unstable. He Sinned by going down to Egypt. He got outside of God's will by going down to Egypt and trusting in the strength of Egypt, which is a picture of the flesh and of sin. And then, not only did he do that, but now he's being deceitful. He tells lies regarding his wife and throws her under the bus. Do you see how his decisions beget more unwise decisions over time? What had to happen in his life? Look at... Uh, Well, I want to be in chapter 13 and verse 3. Abraham went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel. So from the south even to Bethel. So he came back out of that place where he got outside of God's will. He came back into the promised land. And notice what it says, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Unto the altar, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. See what he had to do? He had to go back to where he was at the first. I want to challenge you with this. When you get off line, when you get off kilter, go back to where you were at the first. Say, maybe I, I left the church the wrong way. Well, I'm now part of the church. Okay, you know what you need to do? You need to call that pastor. You need to say, Pastor, years ago I left your church and I did it in the wrong way for the wrong reasons. I'm sorry that I did that. Will you forgive me? Or so-and-so that I wronged years ago. Get back to the place and say, hey, you know what? I, I did this wrong. I'm sorry. Go back to the place where you started. Get back to the basics. Go back to where you were at the first when you called upon the name of the Lord. That's how we get back to wisdom. And now God can bless us going forward. And now we have confidence. Even if something negative happens, I'm doing this in the will of God. 
There's not a question about whether I did right or not. Get back to the place where you started. These many things are just a precious few manifestations in the scripture of the double mind. And the way back, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You're going to end up in a place where you shouldn't be if you follow your own mind and your own heart. And you have a divided heart. And you may excuse it. And you may stay in it. A divided heart is a sinful heart. And it needs repentance. Most will try to get back to the right way without using the door of repentance. And it's like there's a fence along the, a stone wall against the fence, and they keep butting into the stone wall to try to get back on the right way. They have that desire, at least that's good, but find the door of repentance and get back into fellowship with the Lord. Repentance is the door to get back into the house of wisdom. That's what he says in James chapter, uh, James chapter 3, I'm sorry, 4, verse 8. Repentance is the way. Repentance is the way back to the door of God's wisdom. As he said to the church at Ephesus, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, repent and do the first works. Psalm 86, two more passages and then we're done. Psalm 86 and verse 1, bow down thine ear, O Lord, hear me, for I am poor and needy. Is this how we come to the Lord? I am poor and needy. Not my way is the best way. I am poor and needy. Preserve my soul, for I am holy. O thou my God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. I want to be right with you. Save thy servant that trusteth in thee. Be merciful unto me, O Lord, for I cry unto thee daily. I'm constantly looking for your wisdom. Come down to verse 11. He says, teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. And note this phrase, unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with, my, with all my heart. And I will glorify the name forever. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. He says, unite my heart to fear thy name. See, this is the problem with us. We have divided hearts. And the psalmist here said, David said, Lord, help me not to have a divided heart. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I want to serve you with all of my heart, not just part of it. Help me to follow all of your wisdom, no matter if my heart tells me a different way. Follow your heart. No, follow the wisdom of God. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I want to close with Luke chapter 6, because this is not all bad news. We think about the, uh, the trouble that we have and the proclivity we have to have a divided heart. If David did, we sure do. And we think of all the damage that we can do in our lives. And maybe, maybe some of you are thinking, I've done some damage in my life or I've done some of these things the wrong way and I need to get back to God's truth. Yes, you do. But there's a way back and it's easy. And it's called repentance. And get this picture in your mind as we go forward. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Jesus speaking, he says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You are familiar with that verse. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? In other words, you're not following my wisdom. You want to say, Lord, Lord, but then you want to do your own thing. You know what you have? You have a divided heart. On one hand, you're saying this, but on another, you're unstable. You're a waverer. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And what's the picture of the person who says, Lord, Lord, and does not the thing which he says. This picture of the person with divided heart is in verse 49. He that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. This is what happens when we have a divided heart. But what about a united heart? A united heart to fear his name. This is what we can have, and God tells us we can. Verse 47, Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings, my wisdom, and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood rose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. We have the unstable man, the double-minded man, the divided heart man. He's unstable. His house collapses. 
But God says, if you'll follow my wisdom, it doesn't matter what comes against you. It can be vehemently upon you. But you'll stand. You'll not be shaken because you're founded upon the rock, the rock of wisdom. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us as we uh, consider these things from your word. Help us to be uh, uh, so careful concerning seeking our own wisdom. I pray, Lord, that for each one of us that you would unite our hearts to fear your name. Uh, personally and corporately, Lord, we want to be a people and a church that honors you and that is not divided spiritually. We want to have one, fo- one goal and one focus to honor you in our lives. And we want to be that house that stands no matter what comes, that when the, the waves come and be vehemently upon us, that we're founded upon the rock and we'll be able to stand against these things and against the wiles of the devil. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the, the great wisdom that you've bestowed upon us the wisdom in the person of Christ and the spirit of God, the wisdom in the word of God and the wisdom in your church. In your church. We pray that you'd help us to always be devoted to those things as we ought to. We ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.